All right. Welcome to week three. Um, before I start with today's lecture material, I need to go over uh, something that might stress some people out. Assignment one, not lab one, lab two. This is an assignment assignment. And um, the grading on it is going to be very clear. So there's no big mysteries there on how it's graded. You will form groups of two or three. They have to be in your lab section. So you can't, you know, I can't have a student from Wander's group, a student from Alam's, and a student from mine in a group. That's not going to work. I'll explain to you why in a minute. Uh, however, you are, you are to try to find group members in your lab section. So assignment one will cover pretty much everything from this week and uh, next week is basically put everything you've learned till the end of next week. Um, it is due the Sunday before the, uh, the summer break. So it'll be due. Oh, actually, hang on. It should be right on the assignment when it's actually due. June 18th, end of day. So you literally have almost a month to do this assignment, which is not that bad. Um, so it's you'll be submitting four files in your group. Only one group member needs to submit unless your lab prof says otherwise. And you are given a series of scenarios and you need to go into the assignment to see them. Um, but I'm going to go through the assignment first and then go through the scenarios really quick. So there are four files. One's a document, two diagrams, and then something else. Um, so the design document is basically going to be a Word document or a PDF. So either give it to us as a Word document or as a PDF. If it comes as some weird Mac Word document format, we probably won't be able to open it to read it. So stick to something that works pretty much everywhere. Um, you're gonna have a little section at the top that says who the group members are, the scenario. Um, you're gonna list the entities and the short description of what they represent. This should sound familiar, kind of like lab two. Um, you're also going to talk about business rules and we'll be talking about business rules soon. Um, and you're going to provide enough. You don't need to give every single thing you can think of, but giving me one or two does not count either. Um, a list of unknowns because with every kind of database work, when you're first starting out, not as a student, but starting out any project, uh, there's always unknowns. Like you'll come in, you'll read the scenario, you'll go, I don't know this or I don't know that. So you'd put down the unknowns. And then because you may not get a lot of feedback, you're also going to list your assumptions. So you're going to list your unknowns. Then you're going to list the assumptions on how you're going to deal with the unknown. So like you could say, um, if I was going to work with a group of so like a list of students, I'd go, this is a list of students. An unknown is I don't know if they can have more than one address. We'll assume they can only ever have one address. So the point of the unknowns and the assumptions is basically to cover your back end for the rest of the assignment. So if you decide to do something a little out of the ordinary, a little weird with your database design, but you made appropriate assumptions and appropriate unknowns, it gives us the wiggle room to kill. It still give you your points, right? So if you say, oh, well, you know, we assume that students can have two addresses, therefore you designed for two addresses, even though really you only need the one, that would be, you know, an example of an assumption and you covered it. And I am not going to go point by point breakdown because I'll be here for the entire class just talking about the assignment. Uh, but you can see literally how the points are broken down per piece. Um, then you'll be giving a conceptual diagram, which is literally what today's lecture is about. So we'll be covering that. And it's also what lab three is about. 
Uh, so you are, based on what you came up in the design diagram, you will create a conceptual diagram. And it has to be in a um, one of the two conceptual diagram formats. I personally prefer the old style, which I'll be talking about today. Um, but this, you know, you're going to identify, you put in all the identified entities. Uh, you should have at least its candidate key identified. Relationships are defined uh, by the business rules. There's going to be a label on the diagram. You're going to slap the name of the group members on the diagram. Literally, I'm giving you two points in that section just because you put your name on it. Because I've had work submitted with no names on it. So I'd rather give people points for, you know, successfully writing their names down. Um, then you're going to give me a physical diagram. And that's what you're going to be learning, you know, over the next couple of weeks. And you're going to basically convert the conceptual diagram into a physical diagram. You're assigning it the proper data types. Uh, you're going to make sure it's properly normalized, which is the lecture in like two weeks. Um, defines the relationships properly, all the primary keys are created, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you'll see all the requirements, they're very clear. And then you'll have the breakdown. And once again, you get two points putting your name on it. So you get two points for your introduction in the first document, you get two points on the second thing, you get, you get six points just for putting your name down out of uh, 67 points. So literally 10% of the points, well, almost 10% of the points is just you putting your name down on the files. And you even get a point for giving us the right format. Because again, I've had people submit Mac documents to me, which go to my Windows laptop and it goes, no. Well, that's an easy grade. Um, so, as I said, you'll read through the assignment. You will see that it's very clear what the point breakdowns are. Um, now, when you go into the assignment itself, you'll see that it's all there, but there'll be uh, three scenarios in here. And your group picks one. And I will go over the scenarios really, really quick um, so that you have an idea. So scenario one is the clearest of the three. It also means there's the least room for creativity. Again, database design is a creative process. It's not, there's no one way to do any given thing. However, in document one, it's very cut and dry. The information is very clear, very straightforward. Uh, it literally gives it to you in point form. It gives you sample outputs to base your data on, that uh, your data structures on. Et cetera, et cetera. It is very clear. There's already pre-built business rules practically in it. Scenario two. <laughs> so this was my favorite pizza shop. They're not around anymore. They shut. They they sold out last year, and the pizza went to crap. Um, I, I feel a little sad because it was like the best pizza on the West End. Um, now, if anybody here's ever worked in the in a pizza shop. You will know that a pizza shop is like no other food industry out there. And people will go, well, it's pizza. Yeah, you can go to McDonald's and get, you know, extra pickles put on your burger. It's McDonald's gone to the point where it's kind of kind of flexible in how that handles. But until, you know, what about five years ago is when they started allowing that in Canada where you could really customize your burger. The only place you saw stuff like this was in a pizza shop where you can order a pizza and you have pick of sauce, pick of cheese, pick of toppings, size, extra cheese, thin crust, you know, ex all this complications. The pizza shop is, and I, I like using this phrase, it's the trap. Um, it is the easiest, a lot of people go, I understand about ordering food, I eat out all the time. Yeah, you probably don't understand how complicated it is in the back end. It's not like you're going down to your favorite shawarma shop and ordering a shawarma. You know, it's not that fancy. Um, so it is the one you get to be the most creative with of all of them. 
So what you are given, instead of a nice set of rules, you are given a menu that shows you what kind of stuff they sell and a receipt. And yes, I actually did at that point order pizza just so I could have a receipt for you guys. So this was a few years ago, as you can see uh, the date on there, it's uh, 2019. But yes, I actually did order pizza, so I had a proper receipt for, for this assignment. Ordered a couple of pizzas. Um, oh, yeah. But just saying, so you have a receipt that shows you the kind of the money thing they worry about, what they seem to collect, and how it gets collected. And so in this one here, essentially, you're going to design how their menus contained in the database and how you take the menu items and convert them into a series of orders for a customer. That's basically what your, your goal is. Um, and the third one is an, an old scenario that I was thrown at me when I was in school. It's been readjusted a little bit since because it was actually an American scenario. So it was dead president high school, not dead prime minister high school. So it's been Canadianized a little. Um, and essentially what's happening here is there was a meeting that gave you an outline of what the data is. You have to take into account in this one that there may be data that overlaps because all the different stakeholders have a slightly different view of the data. Like the receptionist that does attendance might, or the teacher that does attendance, the principal or the club leaders may see the data slightly differently. Therefore. Um, you want to make sure when you read this that you understand the different ways or the different perspectives a person may have. So, like I said, the first one is the most clear cut, least flexible. Second one is the most flexible, but it's also the most complicated. The third one is somewhere between the two. So there's a fair amount of flexibility available to you. In other words, flexibility equals creativity, but they give you a bit more information. You just have to make sure you understand uh, what some of these things are. And of course, if you have questions, that's when you ask them in lab. Ask your lab profit clarifications on what some of this stuff is, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, so that'll, that'll be that. You will, the other reason why it's due that date, and I have to double check, make sure I'm, I don't have my dates wrong. I think I got the date right is during your lab period, the week after it's due. You will sit down with your lab prof and have a two minute conversation about your assignment. It is us verifying you did the work yourself. And yes, we were doing this before chat GPT because people were still submitting work to the assignments to, I don't know, Chegg. There's a popular one that I've seen. Although Chegg stocks were thanks to Chad GPT, so that's good. Um, like we had found one of our assignments in Chegg where somebody submitted an assignment and paid for someone else to do the work for them. And then we had them sit down in the lab and they had no idea what any of the things in the documents said. We're just going to sit down with you to discuss your assignment and what your design choices were, just to make sure that you actually did the work yourself. That's what it is. We are not grading you on your presentation skills. So if you come and you're the most awkward person on earth, that's okay. Just don't pass out. All we're doing is verifying that you did the work yourself. That's all. Not anything more, nothing less. It is what it is. Okay. So like I said, if you need clarification, reach out to me. lm has been through this set of assignments twice before. I think this might be Wander's first kick at the can. So. I'm sure he'll be asking me questions if he's not sure about how things are supposed to be handled. Um, but overall, it's fairly, it's not a hard assignment. It's just a time consuming assignment because you've never done this before. Therefore, it's gonna take you a little longer than it would take someone who's done it for a few years or someone like me has been doing it for 26 years. Students ask me, how long would you take you to do this assignment? 20 minutes, 25 minutes, maybe. But by the same token, I've been doing this for how long?
So the usually we figure out how much time it's going to take is I take how long I think it's going to take, double it, double it, and double it, and add 50%. And I figured that might be about right for students. So if I take my half hour and I double it, that's an hour, two hours, four hours. So we're going to say, you know, four to six hours sounds about right of work for this as a group. If it takes you longer, it takes you longer. If you're fast, you're fast. Don't say, oh man, I hit six hours and I'm not done yet. Maybe your group sucks. I don't know. Just saying, you know. And the other thing is I'm not a fan of group politics. So by that, it means uh, if you have a team member that suddenly goes missing in action, let us know early. Letting us know the day before it's due and you go, yeah, I did all my work and my teammate ghosted me and they said all I was going to, their, submit, their, their part of the work was they're going to submit the files. Yes, I've had that conversation. That they thought the, their, their, the team member's work was going to be they upload the files to Brightspace. That was their contribution to the assignment. We need to know that early so we can address the issue before it becomes an issue. Um, that's part of learning to work as a group, right? Don't be a doormat and uh, and don't ghost your teammates because that's just rude. And for those of you that don't know what ghosting means, it means you just decide to stop answering. All right. So that's the assignment. Um, now I'm going to dive into this week's content. Uh, like I said, reach out to us during your lab period. I'll be at my lab period. Alem's usually at his lab period. I'm sure Wander's at his lab period. Yes. Root to three. So you work in, so it's really too much work for one student. Two students, it's about right. Three is okay. More than three, there's not enough work for everybody. As it is, three is okay. It's not great. Like, Realistically, you got two people doing diagrams and the last one's documenting. So two to three, no more. And of course, if you're one of those people that can't find a team, a group member, or you like preferring working as a group of one, because there are always those that like to work as a group of one, I'd rather if you did not, because it's always good to have a second set of eyes to check your work. Um, I often send my work to somebody at my office to say, hey, do you see anything stupid with what I've done here? Just give me, you know, sanity check. And having a second set of eyes looking at the work is always a good thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've actually had cases where I've had groups work with other groups. As in, they were validating each other's work. As long as it doesn't look the same, we're I'm not too picky about that. Because sometimes having an entirely different group perspective on something is also not a bad thing. So just saying, like, take advantage of having peers, essentially. All right. Any other questions before I dive into this week's lecture material? Going once, going twice, going three. To, okay, we're done. Too late. Okay. Um, there's a whole list of bullet points here about learning outcomes of what we're trying to aim today. Essentially, I'm going to talk about diagramming. That's what this list of bullet points is. So, <clears throat> data modeling All right, let's try that again. Data modeling is a method or technique used to document basically a database using entity relationship diagrams. So, we're going to be you guys are going to be learning about ERDs. Uh, there's a few different kinds of ERDs. And essentially the ERD represents the data structure. And depending on what stage it is, it represents the entities, attributes, and relationships, or it represents tables and relationships and fields. So there's two kinds, there's three kinds of diagrams at multiple stages. They cover different parts of it. Um, Usually, it's a strong expression of an organization's business requirements. Um, there's many purposes. So there's conceptual models, physical and logical. Um, they're all called ERDs. Their notation is different in them. Uh, they serve slightly different purposes. But they're all called ERD. It's just a different level 
of ERD. And it's often used as a guideline, as in you diagram it, therefore you follow the diagram when you're implementing things. And sometimes the diagram lets you see things that you might not have seen otherwise. So a data model is a blueprint, essentially. So you're going to have a diagram. The diagram sets down the rules of how the database is going to be built. Um, have they started talking to you guys about UML diagrams yet for Java? No? Okay. Okay. So you'll learn about UML diagrams soon enough, guys. <laughs> However, um, a data model is more generalized and abstract than a database design. A database design is literally the blueprint of the structure of the database. You can think of it this way. The conceptual diagram is like you're sketching or you're getting a house built. You decide you're going to get a house built. And I don't know if anybody in here has ever been part of the process of getting a house built. Um, I say that every once in a while, I'll get the random student said, yeah, me. And they're usually, you know, in my peer age group. So, but it happens or their parents got a house built. And usually when you get a house built, they don't design a blueprint as the first step. They'll sit down and sketch out, you know, with a designer, roughly what your house is going to look like. That's a conceptual diagram. It, it shows out oh, there's going to be like three windows here and two windows over there. We don't know exactly where they're going to go, but that's roughly the look we want. And then the database design is literally the blueprint that's given to the architect. Uh, the, the architect designs it, gives it to the, to the engineers, and they build the house. So that's the difference between a conceptual and a physical diagram. So there's three design stages. So there's a conceptual, which I just described a little bit. It basically sketches out in broad strokes the concepts of the database. It basically shows the entities, their relationships, and their attributes. You have a logical design, which is the in-between step between conceptual and physical. A logical design is database agnostic. And that means that it will apply regardless of what backend you're putting on there. Is it going to be MySQL, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server? Logical makes no difference. It doesn't care. So it's at the point where it's you know pretty much set, but it's not nailed down tight. Then you get the physical design, which is specific to the platform you're implementing on. So in the assignment, you're going to give us a conceptual diagram and a physical diagram. There's not a lot of difference between a logical and a physical diagram. There's just you know slight differences. So today we're going to concentrate on the conceptual diagram. So conceptual diagrams include all the important entities and the relationships. It may or may not list the attributes. Now this is where even the conceptual diagram has degrees of complexity to it. If it's what's known as a regular conceptual diagram, there are no attributes. All you have is the entities and their relationships between them. So you have teacher, student, and a relationship. That's all that's on there. There's no attribute describing anything. It's just really high level. Uh, if you have something called the extended conceptual diagram, you'll have the attributes. You may have candidate keys or potential identifiers listed, but there will be no primary keys yet. But you will have the attributes and whatnot listed on the diagram. This style of diagram has been around for a very long time. Um, if I remember right, the person's last name who created these was Chen. He was a data scientist working at IBM. And he came up with this in the early 70s. And the style has not changed since. Like the, He came up with every symbol you needed in the 70s, and it's been the same ever since. Uh, it just goes to show how database design really has not changed. Because data doesn't change. It's different data, but really data is data. It's been the same forever. So a logical diagram includes all the entities and the relationships among them. All the attributes are now specified. The primary keys exist. The foreign keys are also specified. Uh, if there's normalization that needs to happen, it happens at this stage. We'll cover normalization in two weeks. I guarantee it's going to be the most painful lecture of the term. Just giving you something to look forward to. It's, it's just some people get it and some people don't. 
It's, it's that simple. Either you get it or you don't. And if you get it, it's easy. If you don't get it, you struggle. And then half the ones that struggle get it eventually. And then the other half just ask their classmates to do the work for them. It, it is what it is. Uh, I'm generalizing. It's usually not, you know, 50, 25, 25, but term to term, those, you know, in general adjusts. Physical diagram. Now, the physical diagram is basically the next step after the logical. It specifies all the tables and columns. That sounds familiar. Foreign keys exist. That sounds familiar. You may actually do some denormalization at this stage because because just because you've normalized and made it awesome and it can handle absolutely everything, you might not you might have gone too far, so you might want to dial it back a little bit. Um, the physical considerations might cause a data model to be quite different from the logical data model. Um, the logical data model, it's rare that this happens, but there are cases where uh, in the logical data model, you say, oh, this field is this kind of data, and you discover that that data type does not exist or whatever. So you have to adjust your plans around that. Uh, and the physical data model will be different for every database engine. Um, usually, more than anything else, it's the data types. MySQL has certain data types. Microsoft SQL Server has different data types. Oracle definitely has different data types. Um, Postgres has, again, different data types. And I, I'll use one very uh, common one that you'll see that is different every, you know, all of them. There's a data type called text. Text is basically an undefined length blob of text. It's not a specified string. It's literally, you could just dump in an entire life story if you want into that one field. Now, in Postgres, it's called text. In Microsoft SQL Server, it's called memo. In um, Oracle, it's called a clob. Character large object. In MySQL, it's either small text, text, or large text. Why? Because they decided they need three different kinds just to make life hard. Other database servers will use one of these other types. So the physical diagram will be different depending on what your target is. Just like you have a perfectly good blueprint for a house and the building standards in Ottawa are different than the building standards in Austin, Texas. You might have the same layout, but the rules of how the house gets built is different depending on where you're at. Different insulation, different stud depths, that kind of stuff. All right, so the ER dia model is a set of concepts and symbols that are used to create conceptual schemas. And the original model is by Peter Chen. Man, I'm glad I remembered his last name right. Um, we came up with it in 1976. The original draft is in like 1974, so early 70s. And he had a version before that. Um, the ER model and later extensions are made to the Chen, mo Chen model, so they created subtypes and all kinds of stuff. Um, it's referred to as the extended ER model. So whenever you hear me just say an ERD or an ER model, I'm referring to an extended Chen diagram. So. We're just setting the baseline here. So the ERD is a pictorial representation of the information. And database pros can use the ERD to concisely and accurately document the structure of the database. Um, and usually, an ERD can be transformed easily into a logical schema. Um, there are three components in an ERD. So there's three symbols you need to remember. Oh, that hurts. Three symbols. Entities, attributes, and relationships. And right now we have, why is that there? That shouldn't even be there. Okay, anyways. So when we talk about, I'm gonna use this slide for some of this. This slide shows two things. It shows entities, and relationships. So the relationship is this line with the diamond. The entities is a square. Attributes are usually in an ellipse. I'm pretty sure we got a sample later of that in the slides. Um, 
And this is showing a really old style of notation. So this is pre what we're going to be using in this course. And this shows, you know, if it's a one to one relationship, one to many or a many to many relationship. Um, so you'll notice that they'll have the notation in the box, in the diamond here. NM means many to many. 1N means one to many. One to one, well, it's one to one. So when we're doing this diagram, there's something called cardinality. Cardinality expresses how much one entity relates to another. If we go back over here, we'll see that this has a one-to-one -one relationship. So it's saying that the minimum cardinality is one. An employee has a badge. And the badge has one employee. The minimum cardinality in the second one is saying an employee may have a computer. So the first one is mandatory, the second one is optional, and the third one is both optional and mandatory. Um, it'll make more sense when I get to some further slides. Um, but essentially, a you will draw the relationship like this. I, I think I showed you guys ERD plus last week, right? Was it with you guys? I think I'm pretty sure you, right at the end I showed you a diagramming tool. I was pretty sure it was you guys. I know I showed it to my other group, but I was pretty sure I showed you guys too because it was still open on my laptop. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, I gave you guys a little quick preview. So, you know, when you it was drawing the relationships, there was options in there for that. So, a minimum cardinality of zero indicates that it's optional. It means that you're going to put a circle next to the optional entity. A maximum cardinality, a minimum cardinality one means it's mandatory, and you put a vertical slash. So if I go back over here, so if you were, if we we're going to look at this one, we're going to go an employee skill. An employee must have a skill. The skill may belong to an employee. So this is saying that an employee has many skills because it's a many to many relationship, but it's saying every employee must have at least one skill, thus the mandatory here. They might have multiple skills, but not all employees have all the same skills. That means a skill could be assigned to one or more employees, but not all employees will have the same skills. For example, at my day job in my office, for those that have the SQL skill, let's say we have, I think we've got like 10 programmers, uh, 10 developers. Out of the 10 developers, two of us are experts in X SQL. The rest of them don't know SQL. So that means that SQL is a many, many relationship because it's used by multiple people and multiple people have SQL, but not everybody has SQL. That's literally how you'd read that last one. And that's actually saying the exact same thing. Skip that one. So, however, what we're going to be using in this course is something called crow's foot notation. So crow's foot came along a little bit after the initial Chen diagram. And it'll use the entities as boxes, you know, and lines between boxes. There's different symbols at each end of these lines. And it's this is the symbols we're going to be using in this course. So when you use ERD plus to do your conceptual diagram, when you set your relationships, it will use the crow's foot notation. And it is as follows. The if you got Two lines, it means it's mandatory one. That means, again, back to the employee and badge. If the employee, an employee has a badge, they must have a badge, and they only ever have one badge. Well, I could turn it around with this like this for you guys. Every student has a student card, a student ID card. You have one student ID card. Each student ID card belongs to one person. And you can only ever have one student ID card. Or we could use UPASS. Take your pick which one you want to call it. The other one is mandatory many. Yeah. Well, yeah, in theory, yes. Um, like, for example, here at the school, I get a badge, right? It looks actually an awful lot like the student's photo ID. I get a badge. I get one badge. 
and only one badge. Now, in my day job, I've got two badges, not two badges, I've got two cards and a fob, but I don't have a badge. But there's a card for the parking garage, a card for the front door, and then a fob to get into the actual office space. Depending on your company, yes, it's gonna be slightly different. We're using this as an example. But for like here at the college, each employee gets one badge and only one badge. We must have a badge because we can't get into certain office spaces without it. Therefore, we must have a badge, but we're only ever allowed to have the one badge. If I lose my badge, they cancel my old one and give me a new one. So mandatory many means there must be um, multiple entries, at least one, but there could be more. Um, I'm going to use the line of, man, I hate using this line, but I will because it's the easiest. Okay, to be a mother, there must be a child. I didn't say the child came out of her, but she must have a child. So to be a mother, they must have a child. That's what defines a mother. There's a kid. They could have many kids. That makes no difference. The second they have one kid, technically their mother, therefore, to be a mother, they must have at least one kid, and they could have multiple kids. I hate using that example, but it's usually the easiest one to explain. Um, so you've got optional one. So for example, uh, the U-Pass is a good example. Because if you live outside, outside the city where there's no bus service, you can choose to not get a U-Pass. You can get your U-Pass refunded. So then you just have a normal student ID and you don't have the special U-Pass version of it. So the, the, the U-Pass is, it's optional that you have a U-Pass, but you're only ever allowed to have one U-Pass. You lose your U-Pass, you have to go get a new U-Pass. They cancel the old one, you get a new one. So it's optional one. An optional many is the same idea where um, when they assign me to a course, I'm assigned to a course, but I don't have any students yet because they haven't loaded the students in my course shell. That means that I can have zero or more students in my course at any given point in time. So that's optional many. In other words, I can be given a course and not have any students yet, but theoretically I can have many students. Um, so that's the, th the four pieces of notation here. So in the original diagram, you would have had a department and employees. So each employee can belong to one department. They may not belong to any departments, but they might belong to multiple departments. So you could have someone that doesn't belong to any departments, or they could be in multiple departments or just the one. If we were going to do it with the crow's foot notation, we would go... Each department has at least one employee, potentially many. Each employee might belong to department and only one department. So that's how you'd read that diagram. They're both valid ways of doing this. The second one's the one we're preferring for this course. Pretty much every database design tool uses crow's foot. And this is a sample of a many to many. So back to my employee skill thing. Each employee has at least one skill. They can have multiple skills. Each skill could belong, may belong to an employee and might be assigned to multiple employees. So this leads us to um, strong and weak entities. And before the end of today, because I think I'll, be, I'll have time today, as I'll go show you guys a sample of a proper conceptual diagram so you understand how to read it. Um, so a strong entity is an entity that can exist on its own. An example would be a person, an automobile, automobile or a building. A weak entity is an entity who, whose existence depends on the presence of another entity. An example is an apartment. An apartment cannot exist without a building. Um, now I just wanna make sure, yeah, okay. So I have, a much better example for you guys. I'm assuming there's people in here with student loans. It's probably a pretty safe bet. Now, a loan is a strong entity. A loan exists on its own. A payment against the loan is a weak entity. 
You cannot make a payment without a loan to pay. Can you imagine you walk into the local BMO and you go, take my money, I'm paying a loan. They go, what loan? I don't have a loan, just take my money. It makes no sense, right? It will not work because the payment cannot be applied to something that does not exist. Therefore, a payment is a weak entity. The loan is a strong entity. That usually tends to be a slightly better example for people than the apartment thing. Okay, so a weak entity is also known as an ID-dependent entity. It's an entity whose identifier includes the identity, the identifier of another entity. Um, so an ID-dependent entity is logical extension of the parent. So for example, a building is the strong entity, the apartment will be ID dependent on the building. So you could think about it like this. 1371 Carling Avenue is an apartment building. It's known as the Phoenix Apartments. I used to live there. That's why I know the address. 1371, whatever. However, the apartment, say 807, apartment 7, 8th floor. You could go to someone and say, I live in apartment 807. It'll mean absolutely nothing to them. But you go, I live at apartment 807 at 1371 Carling. Now you're qualifying the apartment by the address of the building plus the unit number. Then it's identifiable. Um, you got a painting and a print. Now, some of you may not know this, but you can buy prints of famous paintings and they're numbered. And usually you can't have the print unless the painting exists because at that point, you know, is it really a print? Um, the minimum cardinality from the ID dependent entity to the parent is always one. For example, apartment 807 can only ever exist on this, this specific apartment, can only ever exist at 1371 Carling. You can't, that it is, it's always a one, it's a one way relationship. That apartment can only belong to one building. The building can have many apartments. But each apartment can only ever belong to one building. And then you've got two other uh, notations. So you got identifying relationships and uh, non-identifying relationships. And essentially, if it's an ID-dependent entity, like the apartment, then it's an identifying relationship because the child table is part of the parent. And a dashed line is for non-identifying relationships. I actually have examples in the slides for these. So, all right. Here's our ID-dependent entities. We've got three here. So we've got the building and the apartment. You got, in this case, they're using the building name as the key. And the building has streets, city, state and province, zip and postal code. And it has apartments. And the apartment's identified by the building name and the apartment number. So you'll notice that the primary key or the identifier for the building is also carried down into the apartment. That way we know which apartment we're talking about. Because I'm sure there's a lot of 807 apartments in Ottawa. There's a lot of buildings more than, you know, eight stories. They have at least eight stories. A lot of them have, you know, probably more than seven units per floor. So 807 is not really a strange apartment number. But then if you just say, I live in apartment 807, you have no idea what building you're talking about. Therefore, you still need to know what building it is. Therefore, in this case, it carries the name of the building down into the apartment. And the combination of the building name plus the apartment is how you identify the apartment itself. And this is an ID dependent and it means that the apartment cannot, ex can a record for the apartment cannot be created unless you also have the building name in it. Uh, the painting, same thing. You got the name of the painting, and then you got a copy number. And uh, with a patient, you got the patient's name, and the patient name gets carried into whatever exam uh, with an exam date. Uh, really, it should be an exam date and time, but we'll just go with the exam date. And essentially, in this case, the exam is ID dependent because it needs the patient's name because you can't create the record without a patient to tie it to. And we have another two styles. So we have 
the auto model, and we're handling it two different ways. So you got to manufacture in a model, so a Ford Focus. Um, and there's a description, you know, number of passengers, that kind of thing. And then you, you actually, that's the model of the car. And then you actually got the actual vehicle. So you'll have the manufacturer number, the model, and the manufacturing sequence number. Now, years and years and years ago, this was literally how you identified a car. Um, before VIN numbers showed up to the party, um, which is what the second example is, you'll have, you'd know it was a Ford Model T and it would sequence 55. In other words, it was the 55th Ford Model T they built. <laughs> and to identify the vehicle, you needed to know it was a Ford Model T, then 55, and that would tell you exactly which car you had. Now, there's another way of handling this, which is the non-identifying one. So the auto model stays the same, manufacturer and model, but the vehicle is a child of the auto model, but it's not identifying. In other words, the primary key from auto model is not carried down. You'll notice they have something in here called VIN instead. So vehicle identification number. The VIN is basically a magic serial number that every car has now. Um, most parts of the world. Europe has them. They're, it's interesting because they don't track it as tightly as they do in North America. Uh, in North America, you know, you can, on the, by the VIN, you can know what plant your car was built in. By decoding the VIN, you can tell that this Ford was built in Oshawa, plant three. It's all in that VIN, uh, which is also how people's Lexuses are getting stolen, by the way, and all the Hondas. Uh, you know, the ones that have the, you've probably heard about all these Hondas and Lexuses getting stolen, the ones with the fobs, no real keys. Uh, the thieves come up, they read the VIN number, and then they look up a database because the, uh, the database for Toyota got stolen with all the VIN numbers, that identify what the fob encryption keys are, and then they just create a new fob and unlock the car and drive away with your car. So, just so you know, fun piece of trivia. VIN numbers are good. If you're curious what they look like, walk up to any car, look right by the driver, the, the corner of the windshield by the drive by the steering wheel. You'll have, see the series of numbers right there. Um, so the VIN's a unique identifier. It allows you to um, look up a car quickly based on just the VIN. It's a strong entity. In other words, it's able to exist without a model being tied to it. Thus, it's using the dashed line to be represented. So a weak entity is an entity whose existence depends on another. Um, an ID-dependent entity is one that includes the primary key of its parent. Um, identifying relations that are used to represent those. Sometimes the entities are weak, but they're not ID-dependent. So you put them as non-identifying. Um, and then you mark it out as being weak. So back, the crow's foot, we went through that, so I'm not going to go through it again. Um, so in the strong entity relationship, there's three basic types that you'll see. One-to-one, one-to-many, -one, one and many-to-many. -many. And essentially, here's a quick form that shows uh, the relationship. And this is a one-to-one. -one. This is another one that you guys should be able to relate to. How many of you guys have lockers? Anybody in here have a locker at the school? Really? Like nobody here has a locker. Holy shit. That's the first time I've ever said, everybody here's got a locker. No, wow. So 70 something students, 90 students and no lockers. Wow, school's not making money off you guys. <laughs> that little $10, $12 it costs for your locker. Okay, well that's awkward. Um, so at the, the way it works here at the school, that's every school is, you can rent a locker. It's cheap. You're allowed to rent one locker and only one locker at a time. If you want to change your locker, you have to give up your old locker and rent a new locker in a different location. So that means that a locker can be owned by one student. One student can own one locker. They're both strong entities because apparently nobody in this room has a locker. So you're able to exist without a locker. And if you go on the second floor, all the lockers exist without you. Therefore, they're both strong entities, but it's a one-to-one -one relationship where you can tie two strong entities to each other with a one-to-one -one relationship. 
wow, that was just so weird. Okay, so if we were going to draw it, it would look like this. Optional both sides, because obviously a locker is optional to you guys. Um, trust me, when the winter term comes around, you're going to want a locker. <laughs> Put your winter jacket and your boots in there. Um, so optional locker exists to you. You exist optionally to the locker. You're only ever allowed to have one both ways. A one to many would be a club uniform. I'll just go to this because I like the diagram better like this. So anybody here ever participate in a club, a sports club at school where you were assigned a uniform? Some, okay, at least one, thank God. Two, whew, thank you for saving me this time. Um, so for example, a lot of times it's sports, sports clubs, hockey, baseball, you know, volleyball, whatever. And you are assigned a uniform at the start of the, the year. And they'll have stacks of uniforms and you're assigned a uniform. There's probably even like a little barcode or a little number that identifies which asset you have. So it's saying that each club member may have a uniform. They could have multiple uniforms. Hockey is a good example because hockey, they always have two uniforms. Home, when you play at home, you have one uniform. When you play at away, you have a different uniform. Don't I don't know. That's just how they do it in hockey. I'm sure it's like that in other sports, but you know, hockey is the first one that came to mind for me. And that means, you know, in that sport, you might have multiple uniforms. Some people may not be assigned a uniform. Like, like the club manager, the, cl the ball boy, whatever, they may not have a uniform. They just go out wearing whatever the heck they wear. But each uniform can only ever be owned by one club member at a time. Can you imagine if you had to share your jock strap with another guy? Nasty. So you're given that, it's yours for the rest of that term. It's probably yours for the rest of your life, but it's yours. You don't share it. You don't get to share the uniform. So the, each uniform belongs to one person. It might not even be assigned to anyone. Maybe there's nobody wearing that size. So that particular size uniform is just going to sit there on a shelf collecting dust. So it's not assigned to anybody. So the uniform can exist without a person. The person, the club member can exist without the uniform, but it's optional both ways. And then you have a many to many, which we're going to go like this. A in the automotive industry, it's interesting. And I know about this because my father used to run a garage, like used to be a general manager at a really big garage in my hometown. You will get parts for cars and you might get the same part from more than one company. And each company will have multiple parts, but they might not all carry the same parts. Um, for example, um, General Motors, GM, so that's Chevrolet, Pontiac, well, Pontiac doesn't exist anymore, Cadillac, uh, and a few other brands all belong to General Motors, GM. And they just happen to also have a brand of parts called AC Delco. AC Delco doesn't carry all the GM parts. The GM manufacturers don't carry all the AC Delco parts. They carry, depending on what you need, you'd order from a different place. But sometimes you can get the same thing from multiple places, like an oil filter. In theory, you could get a, an oil filter, a Fram oil filter from three different suppliers. You might even have a slightly different price from each supplier, depending on what their volumes are. So this is showing that a company can buy parts. A company, so they'll phrase that. A company may sell parts. They'll probably sell multiple parts. They might not even sell any parts that you need. Each part must be sold by one company. It might be sold by multiple companies. Um, actually, we could use um, computer parts as another good example for you guys. Canada Computers sells Micron RAM. Memory Express sells Micron RAM. Um, there was another computer company here in Ottawa for a while, but they didn't sell Micron RAM. They sold some other brand of RAM. It's showing that the RAM can be sold by multiple companies. And each company could sell multiple brands of RAM, but they may not all sell the same thing. Obviously, the stick of RAM can exist without the company selling it, 
the company selling it can exist without that particular stick of RAM because they might sell, you know, Corsair RAM or something else instead. That's all. Okay, good. Now I'm going to actually make this, try to make this make sense. Oh, yeah, I got lots of time. I got myself a blank diagram. And I am going to talk about a pet adoption agency. Because, you know, that's always one that most people understand. Most people understand pets, usually. So when we talk about a pet adoption agency, we could think about the varying entities that are involved in one of those agencies. Um, so. First things first, we have, obviously, we're going to have pets. That, that's a pretty good starting point, right? For adopting pets, probably want to have some pets. Uh, what other entities might be involved? So think about, you know, eh? Sure, we're going to call customer, adoptee, uh, adopter. Sure, adopter. Uh... Anybody else involved? What was that? Well, that's going to be the adopter, the person that that, that collects the pet. Uh, the, the, that's okay. Now that that's a little tricky. Seller. What do you mean by a seller? Are you talking about PetSmart, the SPCA? Is it Siri? Uh, that that was so well done. Oh. <laughs> uh, Boy. Um, okay, let's go. Um, we're going to use the word retailer. How's that? Yeah, we're going to go with retailer. That's a place that, that you can go sign the paperwork. So we got a retailer. What was that? A clerk? Yeah, that would be an employee at the retailer. Uh, possibly. Yes. Um, okay, we're going to stay away from breeders. Um, but we're going to go with pets that actually need a home, not pets that are being manufactured to make money. This is coming from someone who's got purebred cats. I didn't buy them. My wife bought them without warning me. It was a nice dent to the bank account that day. But they're adorable. So, you yeah, know. Well, that, that we're going to go with employee. We're just going to stick to employee. So a retailer has employee. The only really other thing we might want to worry about is a medical history for the pet. Because often when a pet gets given up for adoption, so let's go with the process of the SPCA. So, and I've had to do this. Open up my garage door and there's a bunch of kittens and a mama, and a, and a mama cat. How did you get my garage? I have no idea. But now there's... Six cats in my garage. No, I can't keep you. I've already got too many. So grab the cats, you know, pop them in a box, put the mother in a carrier, go to the SPCA, drop them off. They don't immediately take those cats and to the store. They get examined. There's a health check, all that fun stuff. So there's medical records. So I'm going to go put in... Uh, I'll just call it medical. So we have this. So we identified our big entities for now. There's probably more, but we have, I don't want to spend like three hours doing this. So I'm going to throw in some entities in my diagram, and I'm going to call this uh, pet uh, retailer. Why are you ignoring my... There we go. I'm just making everything... Uh, Uppercase to make it a little easier for you guys to read. Uh, it doesn't have the uppercase. Um, we had medical. And we had employee. 
and employee and um, adopter. Okay, so we have our major entities. The next thing we normally would do at this point is we want to put in some attributes. And we're going to keep it simple. I mean, I know for a pet, we could go to town on creating attributes for pets. We're just going to keep it pretty simple. So, what attributes are important for a pet? That's always the first one people say. Who said name? Okay, you're the first one in probably the last six tries that have said it in the first 30 seconds. I've actually had to fish for name. Species is always the first one people say. Name is always the last one. Good job. You're thinking outside the box. So we got a name. We got a species. Uh, age, sure. With like, Yeah, with pets, age is usually what they use because you never really know the date of birth. It's rare you know the date of birth of a cat. I happen to know the date of birth of mine because I've got the records to prove when they came to be. But most of the time, you don't have the age. You have an age, but not a date of birth. Um, another one you'll probably have is the sex, which for most pets, we either actually just use a code because pets have four states depending if they're male or female. You got male, neutered, female, spade. A male still has his junk. It's neutered once he gets snipped. A female, she can have more. Spade means they ripped out the equipment. Right? So when we talk about the sex, they actually treat sex for a lot of pets as one of four, not one or the other. With animals, you know, it's pretty well defined what they are. You know, so, so, you know, and there's species. Um, and then we could actually add one more in here that some people don't always put on. And that is breed. Okay, good. I, I just read your mind. Yeah, a specific breed of dog. Same thing. Get specific breeds. Okay. Hey? Color. Yes, we'll put in color. And then we're going to call it there because that gives us enough. Okay. Um, the adopter. The, so that's the person buying the pet. What do we usually need to track for that? Name. Address. Phone. Email. That's probably enough. Well, there could be a bit of history depending on how detailed we want to get. We're going to try to keep this a little bit simple so you guys have a functional example. Okay. Um, the retailer. So, again, we'll probably have the name of the retailer and the address. Phone. Now you got the employee. Again, you'll have uh, an employee number and a name, and that's going to be good enough. The only other one we have left is the medical. Now, yeah, employee number. Hang on, let me redo that. My handwriting is bad at the best of times. And under medical, we have, what are the things we worry about a medical file? Now, most of most of us have been to a doctor or to a dentist. So you're, you're, you're targeting a, an, an instance, not its attributes. Vaccination status, again, is could be just did they get a vaccine, right? Or what vaccine did they get? Now, so you just, you guys are on to something. Specifically, you might be aiming for the type of entry. So, for example, type of entry would be vaccination, examination, something else, right? What else is important about the medical? The notes. Yeah, the notes. Okay, sure. Um, let's call it notes. 
There we go. Finally, somebody said it. No, somebody said another word that starts with a D. The date and time. We need to know when everything happened. That literally, this plus this plus the date gives us 99% of the data we need for medical. So we need a timestamp. We're going to use the word timestamp because timestamp implies a date and a time. Um, are the genetic status, that could be in the notes. The What kind of vaccine they got, that could be in the notes. You know, oh, dude's got extra toes. That's in the notes. Okay, so that's enough attributes. So I'm going to describe... I'm going to add my attributes on here. So we're going to add an attribute. We're going to go name. Add an attribute. Uh, what else we got on here? We got species. Species. And we're going to add an attribute. And we're going to put in the breed. Add an attribute. And we're going to go age. Add another attribute. Sex. And the last one was color. Whoop, close. Color. Okay. Again, ERD plus is great because it carries all the bits and pieces along with it. We're going to move this stuff out of the way a bit. So we have room. So, so this is what they call, this is a Chen style diagram. Just to go back to what I was talking about half an hour ago. The entities are boxes. Attributes are ovals. The attributes when you learn about physical design next week, the attributes is what will become fields in the database or columns. The entity will become tables. All right, so now we are gonna go do the medical one next because that's probably the, the easiest. So we're gonna do medical and I'm gonna add an attribute, which is, uh, yeah, okay. So I'm gonna call it entry type, keep it short. Uh, Timestamp, notes. Excellent. So we have this. Now I'm going to create a relationship between these two. And in this tool, again, it's use connect and you click on the first one, drag to the second one, and it drops in a relationship. And in here, you can write the relationship. You can go one to, one to N if you want, right? Or uh, has, take your pick how you want to word it. Um, so now a pet will likely have many medical records. Um, again, back to the example of me picking up the mama cat and the five kittens. It was kind of cool because back then they used to give you a little QR code that you could follow the situation with the cat, the pets you dropped off, which was really cool. You could experience their journey through adoption. And it was kind of cute. You know, I'm like, oh, that's kind of good. And uh, they, um, oh, words, Dan drawing. So I could see, oh, they had their initial exam. Oh, they've been given a flea bath. They've been given the deworming medication. They've been given their first vaccination. Oh, they got declawed today. Not declawed, but claws trimmed. Don't ever declaw a cat. Trims. Their claws got trimmed today. They were given their second vaccination. Oh, kitten number one got adopted. You know, that's where his journey ended <laughs> for me. But um, so what we can do is we can say uh, the medical a medical record cannot exist without a pet, and it can only ever belong to one pet, right? It's just like your medical records or your dental records. You go to the dentist, your visit, that visit is you and only you, and it's not for anybody else, right? There wasn't two of you sitting in that chair that day. And on the other hand, the pet in theory, could have an optional medical history. In other words, the pet just got dropped off and they haven't been examined yet. Therefore, in theory, the pet can exist without medical history, but odds are they'll have many medical histories. It's a bit like when you first register at a dentist's office. They'll add you to their system, but you haven't been seen by a dentist yet. So there's no history on your record other than you were added into the system. All right, so now we are going to go uh, retailer. We're going to get the, add the attributes, uh, name, address, and phone, I think is what we decided. Yeah, phone. Uh, 
and employee we're going to add some attributes here we're going to go uh, employee number and uh, name like such and we're going to put in our adopter right here and we're going to add attributes again we're going to have a name uh, address phone number What was that? Email. There we go. Thank you. I was trying to remember everything without turning around. I think these are the big, those are the four. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So at this point, we will have a few things. I'm going to move everything out of the way and I'm going to make some connections. So there are going to be a connection from the pet to the adopter obviously. So each pet can only ever be adopted by one adopter, right? So the pet is one, but it's optional because they haven't been adopted yet, right? They sit in the cage looking sad. And on the other way around, the adopter theoretically could adopt multiple pets. Now, can they be an adopter if they didn't adopt a pet yet? No, that means that they must have one and they may have more than one. So this is going to be a uh, one. Actually, this would be many to one if we want to actually draw the line properly. Uh, I'm going to leave both kinds of notations on there. So you can see where one I actually put the relationship. Actually, that should be N not M. And then the other one, I'm going to just use a verb because you can use both ways in these kinds of diagrams. Um, again, the probably the adopter went through a retailer. So odds are the adopter is a mandatory one because that's where they go through. But each retailer may have many adopters. Maybe they just just signed up and they haven't had anybody adopt a cat yet or a dog yet. Therefore, they're new. They may not have had any adopters. Again, this is going to be a uh, one to N. And then we got our employees. We can connect employees to retailer like such. And in here we have each employee works for at one retailer. Theoretically, yeah, we can have jobs in multiple places, but you're only an employee at that one retailer, you know. So the employee is only at that look at that one retailer. Uh, so that would be uh, mandatory one because you're not an employee if you're not working there, and the retailer is mandatory many because you can't operate you cannot run a business without employees so this is an example of basically what we just did was the first half of the assignment like the first diagram i just showed you guys how to do the first diagram that like you know you break it down Make up. This is like part of that first design document, not the business rules part, but where you talk about the attribute, the entities, and you know what makes it up. And then that's part two. Like that's the second part of the assignment. So I just in twenty minutes, I just did two thirds of the assignment while just brainstorming with you guys and explaining my choices. Um, so what I'm going to do is I will actually put this. I'll upload this example and. I'll take a picture of the board and I'll upload that too as part of the announcement. Just like that. And um, so that gives us all the bits and pieces. So next week, we're going to be talking about physical design. 
In other words, how to convert that and start assigning a data types, making those choices. And what I'm going to try to do is I am going to use this example. So after I'm done the lecture, time permitting, I will take, take this example and convert it to a physical diagram for you guys so you can see the next step of the process. Um, also, next week, I'm going to talk about um, actually, you know what? I'm going to talk about it now. It might show up in the slides, but I want to make sure it gets spoken to you guys. And since I'm recording right now, I won't have the slides for this, but I want to talk about business rules really quick. I'm pretty sure it's in the slides somewhere and it really should have been today, but these aren't my slides. So it is what it is. So business rules, business rules is an interesting concept when it comes to computer to database design, business rules set the rules of how the data is handled. So essentially, when you're doing an initial design, you're gonna set up a series of business rules to determine how the data behaves. It has nothing to do with how the, the rules are enforced. So for example, um, attendance is taken. That, that could be a business rule. It's a little vague, but we'll go with that one. It doesn't say how the attendance is taken or who takes it or who it's being taken of. It just says attendance is taken. It's a rule. That means that we need to track attendance. Um, so business rules must be atomic. In other words, each rule must be self-contained. A rule may depend on another rule. In other words, um, a class must have students. And therefore, you can say attendance is, student attendance is taken. That means, you know, those two depend on each other. Um, they must be succinct. A business rule should be a single sentence. It should not go on and on and on for a paragraph. A rule should be clear. A rule should have the same meaning regardless of who reads it. That sounds a little strange when I say it that way. But so if I write down a business rule saying, um, a customer will be billed multiple invoices. Or I should say, a customer may have one or more invoices. Let's go with that. When I read it as a database developer, it tells me that a customer will have multiple invoices. If I give that to a stakeholder, I don't know, uh, one of the managers, and they read it, they have to be able to tell you what that rule means and what you understand and what they understand for that rule has to be the same. It's a bit like how legal rules work, right? Where you got certain laws and if both sides don't agree what the law actually means, then it's not really a good law. Um, so business rules should be simple, plain English. Sorry the phrase, but it's plain English. Um, atomics, in other words, it's self-contained and it should never change meaning. So that's basically the short version of what a business rule is. Like I said, I know there's slides for this later, but since the assignment talks about one of the first things you need to do is business rules, I figured I should at least, you know, give you guys the summary version of what a business rule is since I saw lots of time in the lecture. Um, so once again, when you go to do the assignment and you're talking about the business rules, you're going to look at the data you're given or the structure and you're going to say, Oh, a company can order parts. It can order multiple parts. A company can order parts from multiple suppliers. That's a business rule saying a company can order parts from multiple suppliers. It's simple. There's no fancy language. Everybody in the room can understand what that means, theoretically. And its meaning doesn't change on context. So those are good business rules. Bad business rules are a uh, vague, unclear, too specific, believe it or not, is sometimes a bad thing. Or you are putting in a rule for something that shouldn't be a rule. Again, saying a teacher will take attendance using a piece of paper. That is not a valid rule because maybe a piece of paper is not just how it's done, but because the rule was written that way, they would have to do it anyways. Can you imagine if I still had to take attendance in front of the start of the class? Uh, for those of you that remember grade school, Dan Goudreau, yeah. you know, we've all experienced that at least once in our lives. Um, so yeah, 
All right. So once again, make sure you, this week, your goal for this week for assignment one is finding your group. Once you've got your group, email it to your lab prof so we know who you're working with. That way we can, because what I will do is we will, um, we, we will know what to expect and who you're working with kind of thing. So let us know who your group members are. If you have questions about what the scenarios and labs mean, talk to us. You can ask questions, that's what we're there for. You're allowed to ask us questions to clarify the scenario because you know that's also a thing, right? You might not know everything. So therefore you ask the stakeholder and who's the stakeholder in this case? Us. All right, um, outside of that, that's it folks for this week. I will uh, let you guys go and I will see you guys in lab or in lecture next week.